So I want to introduce Lucy Hutier. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Environment at Boston University. And I want to give her a big round of applause, and I'm really excited to have her here. So this is the nicest lecture space I may have spoken in, ever. Um, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the urban carbon cycle today. Um, and I've sort of chosen one story arc that I'll discuss, but I'm decent on my feet. So uh, if you want to push me in a different direction, I'm kind of open to it. So please ask questions. If something's unclear, feel free. So um, my research group studies the urban carbon cycle, um, which I'll explain what I mean by that as the lecture goes on. But a lot of uh, the energy that and the work that we're doing is focusing on the process of urbanization and what happens when land is transformed from being agriculture or some sort of um, forested natural quote unquote system into something that is very actively managed covered in weird things like pavement which completely cut off the soils from the atmosphere above and we change some of our human behaviors where some of our um, uh, reliance and choices that we make in terms of fossil fuel and energy consumption change. So uh, a lot of our group's work is on uh, improving our estimates of fossil fuel emissions, measuring fossil fuel and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and a lot thinking about plants. And so today most of my story will be about plants, but I'll touch on some of those other themes and so feel free to ask me. So um, this says carbon and that's true, um, but there are lots of carbon compounds. The one that is my favorite carbon compound is uh, CO2. So um, methane is also a very important greenhouse gas that I can talk about at the end because it's a little bit of a tangent, but most of our effort and most of um, when you hear people talk about the global carbon cycle, they're really primarily referring to CO2. So CO2 is not the only uh, forcing behind climate change. It's not the only driver, but it's the most important one um, in terms of the magnitude of the effect that it's having on our climate. It's also the one that is most unambiguously been modified by human behavior, particularly combustion of fossil fuel. And so I had to include as a good carbon cycle scientist a diagram that you can't read with lots of arrows and numbers, but I won't do this too many more times. But what this is, is this is kind of a cartoon diagram of uh, the global carbon cycle. And this figure is dated, but only sort of. Um, so CO2 uh, comes in and out of vegetation. So when plants photosynthesize, they take CO2 from the atmosphere and they put it into things like wood and leaves. And then an almost equal amount on an annual basis is released through decomposition and respiration, just like we respire. And then the ocean is an approximate carbon balance. There's some release from um, land use change, like I was describing with urbanization. And then there's this fossil fuel number. This says 10 gigatons of carbon per year. And these other numbers in this chart haven't really changed. We have a small imbalance of about one gigaton of carbon per year that's going into land from the atmosphere. And this is a big deal because this means that about half of the fossil fuels that we put into the atmosphere don't stay there. So the rate at which this number is increasing has been slowed because of vegetation. So about half of the CO2, these fossil fuel emissions, stay in the atmosphere, and about half of that half go into plants, and the other half of the half, or a quarter, go into the ocean. So there's my primer. That's my Carbon Cycle 101 class. Um, but I wanted to spend a minute kind of thinking about the magnitude of these numbers and what's changing. And the main things that are changing are the rate at which we're emitting fossil fuels, it's piling up in the atmosphere, warming the, warming the climate, and then there's a land use flux, which is continued development, agricultural expansion, deforestation, which is putting more CO2 into the air. 
Are you with me? That's my most boring, hopefully, part of the lecture. Hopefully it gets better from here. But I wanted to give kind of a little bit of a baseline. So let's look for a minute at this fossil fuel number. This is what fossil fuel emissions have looked like over the last uh, couple decades. And it, I think this is a really fascinating figure. This is, you could see that change from the beginning of the chart that I showed you where it was six gigatons of carbon per year in about 1990 to currently we're about 10 gigatons of carbon per year. And the rates at which our annual emissions have been increasing have varied. So in the 90s, it was increasing at about 1% per year. And then we really ramped it up in the 2000s. That's the big, big recession signal right there. So it was not very big and very short-lived. And actually, the, the slope is nearly right back on track. So this gives a picture of what's happening with emissions. Now, the gray area around this is what our uncertainty is. And so I, for nearly a decade, was at Harvard in an atmospheric sciences group. And this was argued to be the most boring part of the carbon cycle. Because this is economics, this is barrels of oil, we know this problem, this is the easy stuff. What we don't understand are those other numbers. Well, I don't think that's true. Um, we know these numbers on an annual global basis to plus or minus 5 to 10 percent. And that would be more helpful if we had an international treaty to do something about our greenhouse gas emissions. We don't have one of those. Um, and it, this would be more helpful if it were an equitable world in terms of the rate at which people are emitting this or how concentrated those emissions are. And it's far from equitable. Actually, cities, and now we're getting to the urban piece of uh, the story, cities are disproportionately important in this story. So cities cover about 3% of the global land. Over half of the world's population lives on this 3% of land. And 70% of those emissions come from cities. How, how, is that, how is that 70% calculated? Is there dispute about that? It is disputable. It's, um, I, I should have used more, it's attributable to cities. So um, much of the energy that's consumed in cities is not actually generated in cities. It depends on which particular city you are and what the energy infrastructure looks like. In, in the case of the United States, the Midwest is where a lot of energy is, uh, is generated and then exported to other parts of the country. Um, so the 70% is based on where it's consumed as well as where it's actually emitted. So if you look at um, transportation, for example, transportation emissions, so us driving our cars, are about 20% of US fossil fuel emissions. And like, I, I should know this off the top of my head. I want to say it's of the same order of magnitude of that happens exactly in the city. So you still have gasoline and oil refineries that are outside the city that have emissions, but the combustion is happening here. And the electricity is being consumed in cities. That's a number that we can do something about, though. We can do something about it in terms of where we choose to invest our infrastructure dollars and what we do in building efficiency, in transportation networks, and so forth. But 70% is attributable to cities, is kind of the best estimate that we have. Now, these cities are expected to become more dominant. So by 2050, this 3% of global land area that's covered by cities is expected to increase two and a half times. 70% of the population is expected to become concentrated in cities. So cities are becoming even more important. And like I said, we do not have um, policies on a national or international level to control or regulate with any teeth um, greenhouse gas emissions. But cities have been making pledges. Cities um, uh, and regions have been doing much more than international or national government has. And cities 
because it's where the emissions are concentrated and some of the biggest uh, changes are happening in terms of the levers and efficiency improvements are happening in cities, cities are really important. And so cities and city scale policies have the potential to be kind of our first responders in this climate problem. They're also going to feel some of the effects of the climate problem most acutely. So I started out saying that it was uh, five to 10% uncertainty on annual emissions of fossil fuels. Any guesses what our uncertainty on city scale, and I won't even define what I mean by city, I'll just be a little vague. Any idea what the uncertainties on that might be? Keep going up. So the best estimates, and they're not very good, because it's really hard, are 50 to 100% uncertainty on city scale emissions. So if you're the city of Boston or the Boston metropolitan area and you're making a pledge to reduce your emissions by X percent by 2050, which the X may vary, but every, not every, many, many um, cities and municipalities have made pledges to that effect you know, 80% uh, reduction by 2050. But if your uncertainty is 100%, it's very difficult to know if you've attained that. And so that's not the piece that, that I'm gonna talk about today too much, but I wanted to kind of lay the stage of why cities matter in this problem. Um, cities are actually critical in this problem. And in the last couple of years, there's been a lot more attention in trying to get better estimates on what those emissions actually are at the scale at which policy changes are happening. Um, what I was gonna, so I, if you wanna ask me more questions about fossil fuel emissions, feel free. Um, what I was gonna talk about today is another piece of the urban carbon cycle and another piece of this problem, which is the role of plants. Um, now, plants are something that there are, uh, Everybody likes plants, unless you have allergies, in which case you may not like them right this minute. Um, but plants are something that a lot of cities are trying to do um, to increase what their canopy cover is in an effort to store more CO2 from the atmosphere, reduce the urban heat island, slow down runoff. Um, and it sounds like a great idea um, to plant more trees in the city. Um, and I think in the end it is, but there's a lot more to what the role of plants in cities is. Um, so one of the hypotheses that my group has been researching is how do plants, or questions that we've been researching is how do plants behave in cities? Do they behave like our numerical models predict that they do? Um, do the same basic variables control it at the same rates? And so my hypothesis is no, that plants and cities are actually gonna behave pretty differently. So this is a picture looking um, up Com Ave at the Boston Common, and there are a lot of plants in the city. Um, in the case of the city of Boston, and I don't have Cambridge numbers, um, I should have looked up some numbers. I know Boston's numbers very well. Um, it's about 28% of the city that actually has a canopy cover. So that could be a tree on top of a building or trees in parks or, or whatnot, but 28%, which is a good amount. So the role that these plants have in this carbon cycle is non-trivial. Now, the reason I think that plants behave um, differently is because their growing environment is really different. So if you think about a plant growing in the city, um, it will have a longer growing season. The, the leaves on the trees will come out earlier and they'll fall off later because it's warmer in the city. So this map that I'm showing here, this is, um, this is from the Landsat satellite. This is a midsummer image of what the land surface temperature in, Bo in the Boston area or the Northeast um, looks like. And the, if you ignore these lines, that was for a different analysis. But the range in this red part here is about 20, more than 26 degrees. And then by the time you get out into the blues, and those, there's some elevation uh, differences in here, you're at 17 degrees. So you're about a 10 degree difference. And these hot spots that you see are where we have lots of pavement. 
lots of built material that absorbs a lot of radiative energy and lots of people. And so these areas where you have plants in the city are hot and they, they heat up earlier and they stay warm longer. And that could be a good or a bad thing. It's a bad thing if you don't have enough water, but we're very good to our city trees and our neighborhood trees and the trees in our house and that we often water them. Um, and they have a longer growing season, it, several weeks, on the order of three week difference between here and when you get to central mass. That's a big difference. Um, so it's warmer. There are also more nutrients and resources available to the plants in the city. Where you have CO2, which is one of the things that plants want more. Um, so if you go out to central mass, a guess on how much CO2 there is in the air. Um, let's see how, how nerdy you guys really are. Parts per million. Parts per million. About 400 now. About 400. Any guesses what it might be around these streets? Not quite three orders of magnitude. That that's might be what you have right at your tailpipe would be getting close to that. But um, it's you can easily have 600 parts per million. So when we think about what our future climate and environment look like, it'll be a higher CO2. It'll be a higher temperature. We already have that in the city. And plants actually like CO2 a lot. If you give plants more CO2 and they have enough water, they will respond by increasing their growth rate. The other thing that plants really like is nitrogen, which is what your NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizer is. And in the city, in addition to CO2 coming out of your tailpipe, there's also nitrogen oxides. So the rates of reactive nitrogen, which you can think of as fertilizer deposition from the atmosphere onto the ground, is about twice what it would be outside the city. So you've got warm temperatures, high CO2, high nitrogen, and the plants are not as close to one another. And so they have more light. And the only thing that's missing is water. But we're very good at watering plants. And we're in the northeast portion of the United States, which is not particularly water limited. Maybe this month is an exception. But we're generally not water limited. So let me start with light. It's an easier one. Um, you're absolutely right that you're going to have buildings that are shading. Um, but that's really going to be the, a problem where you have very tall buildings. So if you're right around here or if you're in downtown in, the, in like the Park Street area of Boston, absolutely. Although that's where very few trees are. There's an inverse relationship between where you have the tallest buildings and where you have more trees. And that num in the city of Boston, that number of 28%, uh, a lot of that is coming from you know, West Roxbury, Jamaica Plain, these parts that you don't have buildings shading it. Um, and those tend to be trees that are planted along the street, which is one tree at a, a great distance, or in yards, or in parks. Um, so the light, you're right, for a small portion of the city. And soils. Um, I didn't include any of these slides today, but if you like, I could pull them up later. Soils are a complete mess. Um, I'll show a little bit of what's happening in terms of decomposition in soils. Um, but soils can either be more fertile or less fertile. It depends on what they did. Because pretty much all the soils have been disturbed. It's just how were they disturbed. Um, so some studies in the Baltimore area, for example, those areas around Baltimore developed on top of agricultural land. And so in that case, the soils are actually very fertile because you built a city on previously agricultural land. And many cities are built on previously agricultural land. But if you, if you completely bulldoze the area and bring in some poor quality fill, yes. But the mix between those two is tricky. Um, so the soils are would have a big question mark on them. 
So we're not there. Um, so the current rates of nitrogen deposition in the city that we're seeing are something in the neighborhood of 12 at the high end, 20, maybe 25 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. Um, fertilizer, like residential fertilizer applications or God forbid, golf course fertilizer applications are in the neighborhood of 100 kilograms of, car of nitrogen per hectare per year. So we, and the background rate is eight, six, something like that. I'll actually show it in a minute for what the variability looks like. So um, we are definitely benefiting and we're not near the point of saturation. But if you get too much nitrogen, that's the whole acid rain problem all over again. Um, we're not at that point. Um, some of the work that my, one of my colleagues and I are, um, are doing is looking at how much of this extra nitrogen that's coming in is actually staying in the system and how much is actually going right back out. And if it goes right back out, so it's leaching through the soil substrate into the waterways, that creates a different problem because that's, you know, the blue baby syndrome. That's what we end up spending a lot of money in our wastewater treatment plants to try to remove that nitrogen, preventing algal blooms and so forth. Um, CO2, um, I should know the number of, off the top of my head, we're not there, um, except at the really, really um, dense traffic -y areas where, again, you don't have that many trees. Um, ozone and some of the other pollutants that come out of our tailpipes are not so good for plants. Um, but, and what we do in terms of management depends. And what's unclear is what happens when you put all of this together. And the soils one isn't here, but it's a question mark, too. Um, and so a couple of my students and I went out and did a really fun project. We're in this black mass of pavement in here. Um, and we went to all these sites around Boston um, that developed. They all developed from being forests to being some kind of urban development. From very low urban development where it was a, you know, a clearing and a house and a driveway, but there were still a good number of uh, plants left behind, to something like this and street trees. And what we did at these sites is we looked at, well, how much green stuff was there? What did the foliar chemistry of the plants look like? What did the soil chemistry look like? And we took tree cores to see how quickly the trees were growing. And what we found was um, absolutely shocking to me. Um, these are results that are in review. They haven't been published yet, but they're almost there. Um, this is one tree core. So this particular individual tree, it was, when it was growing in the context of a forest, it grew like this. So it had up years and down years. So this is weather. This is you know, some internal competition dynamics. This really low year was the last major gypsy moth infestation we had in uh, Massachusetts. So every single tree core that we looked at, and we looked at over 100, had a, a big dip in 1980. And what we saw, 90% of the time, there were a few where it went the other way, was a massive release response. So immediately after development from a tree growing in the context of a forest to a tree growing in low, low density residential, its productivity skyrocketed. And that's despite the fact that its roots were probably damaged in the process of development. Some of the limbs may have been taken and, and off. And if you think about the trees as you drive around, they're, they're usually often you know, kind of weird looking. Right? You know, they, they've got a wedge out of them for power lines. They have all these limbs removed, which trees don't like. But nonetheless, immediately after development, it skyrocketed. And if we put all of these tree cores together, it was a really consistent response. So this is what the U, this first one, and I've got a few acronyms here, sorry. This is growth rate. So this is how many square centimeters of wood a particular tree puts on in a year. This, this number is what the US Forest Service estimates for these counties, for what the tree growth rates are. And this is what it looked like before those conversion dates. And this is what it looked like after. And we went to some areas that had been urban for a long time, and they were growing like this. And these are street trees. This is a doubling in the productivity. Are these common? Are, are these uh, similar trees? These are actually, 
Oh. No. In this, this case, uh, these are all red oak trees. Okay. Um, if I took something like a Norway maple tree, which is um, one of the very most common trees that you have in urban areas in this part of the country, um, these numbers would be much bigger, but I suspect the pattern would be the same. But we took a common native species. We also measured how many trees there were and what the mass of the trees were. And so in these areas, you had about half as many trees. But if you think about it, the city trees are often really big trees, but you don't have as many of them. So in net, we had about half as many trees, but they were growing twice as fast. And so this would suggest that on half as many trees, we have the same net uptake rate as what you would have in a rural forest. Does that make sense? So a small forest would store less, it would have less carbon in it, but it, small forests tend to accumulate at a higher annual rate than older forests. But if we took a comparably aged, you know, middle-aged forest, um, and these numbers are shocking because if we jump back, I won't, I won't go all the way back, but if, we, if you think back to that diagram chart, that's a really big number because the vegetation is taking up a lot of our carbon. And this is suggesting that trees in the city could actually do a lot, which would suggest, at first blush, that planting trees in the city is a really good idea. Is it? I just have a question, not the answer, <laughs> which is, of those factors that are positive for urban trees, have you teased out which are ha having the I think it's light, but we're actually, um, we just got approval from uh, the Audubon Society to sample, uh, take more tree cores on a bunch of their sites, so we're going to experimentally quantify that this summer. I think it's light is the answer, but the, or CO2 or nitrogen, I think it's light, but all of those matter. And the, the longer growing season of three weeks also, that's almost, I mean, if you think about what our growing season length is from mid-May to, say, um, you know, October, three weeks, is, that's a big difference. Um, so, back to my question. Could this be right? <laughs> is this the whole answer? Should we just plant all these trees and get rid of, you know, all of our lawn spaces where toddlers like mine love to make a mess of themselves? Um, what am I missing here? No, you have gaps and uh, and other things. You don't, you know, if you think about walking through the woods, you know, if you have really large trees, you're going to have very few of them uh, in a unit area. If you have small trees, you'll have more of them. Um, the piece that's missing here is death lifespan. and lifespan, um, where many of the trees that we have in the city are fast-growing trees that live fast, die young. That Norway maple. Um, and when it may grow really fast, but it dies really fast. Other, if, this were, if this were the whole story, then the city growing this fast would be inundated with trees. And the other piece here, and this is uh, work that one of my students is going to write up this summer, is how does the death rate compare? And it turns out that the death rate of trees in cities is about five times higher. <laughs> so if you survive, it's a nice place to be. But the odds are against you compared to if you were growing in a forest. Um, and the other piece of this story is if, OK, I'll go back. I don't have that many slides. So back to my ugly, difficult to read diagram. So we talked about this. And we've been talking about photosynthesis, so growth rate and accumulation of wood. We've talked a little bit about land use change. The other piece is this respiration. So photosynthesis and respiration on a global scale are nearly balanced. You have a little bit more, 120 gigatons of carbon per year going into the Earth's 
biological system through photosynthesis and 119 coming out. And that's a big deal. Like I said, that means that 25% of our fossil fuel emissions are not staying in the atmosphere, making it even warmer. They're going into the biota. And I'm arguing that urban biota are actually shockingly productive. Um, the other piece is that decomposition respiration piece. And we set out to try to see what that decomposition respiration looked like. And there's a lot of CO2 outgassing out of all of those vegetated areas. And it turns out that it's a lot more than what a natural system would lose. Because this, so this blue line here is showing urban forests. And so this is decomposition. So this is, um, you know, uh, the maintenance autotrophic respiration of, of the system, so just me exhaling, think of a tree, root system and so forth, as well as decomposition, so leaves that fall and slowly decompose dead woody material. These are urban forests, and this is one seasonal cycle, so this is, so this is last summer, and this is the rate at which those forests are decomposing. That's about the same as it would be outside the city, more or less. This is what lawns respire, and this is what yard, quote unquote, respires. And yard is this messy thing, which is what a lot of our urban area is, which is landscaped and mulched and cleaned up somehow or modified or fertilized or compost treated or all these other things that we do to make our soils more productive. So it's these sort of areas that have really thick um, patches of leaves. So it turns out that that biological respiration in cities, this is a two and a half, this is a seven. So the biological growth is about twice as big but the respiration is more than twice as big. Um, well, at least on a per unit land cover basis. And I'll walk you through, I'm going long here, so I'll, I'll go through this a little bit quickly. This is a slice through Boston. So this is about 25 kilometers. This is a Google Earth image of what it looks like. So the heart of Boston here, and then it gets pretty forested. This is how much pavement we have. This is a one meter product that we've been working with for how much paved area there is. You could see that there's not a lot of exposed soil. This is almost all paved and then it gets less. This is how much, what the land use and land cover look like across this stretch. So these gray areas are largely paved. So they're industrial commercial areas that don't have a lot of vegetation. Pink is residential and green is forest. And then this is what those fluxes of the respiration look like. So it's quite low in these inner areas where you have pavement, because that's not respiring much, N not very much. Um, and then it gets high quickly. And it turns out that um, this is the same data. This is distance from the heart of Boston Common out and this is how the amount of pavement drops, your forested area increases, and your residential land area increases. And this is what the respiration looks like. So it's low in the most inner part of the city, but it rises really rapidly. So I've, kind of, I've hopefully framed the urban carbon cycle in terms of the fossil fuel problem. But I've also looked at the biological end of the system and what the plants in the city are doing and the role that they're contributing. Um, to put this in, um, these are some concluding thoughts. To put this in perspective, um, vegetation in cities and tree planting initiatives like plant a million trees in New York City, which is an active, ongoing, a very expensive initiative, or a million trees Los Angeles. Boston's was 100,000 trees. It was a little more conservative and actually we have made negative progress towards that goal. Um, this city may not like me saying that, but it's true. Um, they have not been planting at a high enough rate to offset that very high mortality rate of trees. Um, the role of vegetation in terms of a sink, and I've, I've skipped a few steps to get to this number, can be maybe 10% of fossil fuel emissions.
that's defining urban loosely, not just looking at the heart of Boston, which is heavily congested with some of the highest rates of fossil fuel emissions, but in a more integrative, say, uh, you know, the I-95 belt. Um, but those fluxes and emissions don't happen evenly. During the day, those respiration fluxes could be actually 30% of the CO2 that we're seeing in the air. And this is a big deal for some of the other work that I could answer about offline of how do we actually verify what the emissions are. And I have lots of ideas, and we're doing a lot on that, including instrumenting the city of Boston and Cambridge, where we directly measure it. Um, but that means that the plants actually mess with our numbers pretty dramatically. Because at the same time that fossil fuel emissions are high, you have photosynthesis that's drawing CO2 down. And at night, it's all being released. And it creates a numerical challenge. Um, and the, this problem of cities and the emissions that are happening here is something that's going to continue as urbanization and densification and expansion increases and continues in the US as well as globally. And the cities, I'm optimistic despite a lack of national progress that we are doing a lot and we are making progress and a lot of it is happening in cities because there's a political will to do something about it. Um, and so I'll stop there on a hopefully positive note having gone a bit over time. Thanks. I can try. Um, I apologize. I came in a little late. You may have covered this. Um, in addition to covering uh, or measuring the amount of carbon di dioxide coming out of soils, we were also doing um, soil carbon measurement of the soil itself to see how much was going into that sink. Mm -hmm. okay. were, were those rates sometimes or often greater, or were they comparable? So residential soils, uh, like in in people's uh, like in those low medium density residential areas, actually tended to have higher amounts of carbon in the soil because of landscaping practices. So those fertilizer, mulch, compost applications have mean that the soils are richer in carbon than they would have been if it were a forest or what it looks like in the forested area. And there's some, and, and lawns are actually uh, carbon sink in terms of the net accumulation rate because of the thick root mats, but lawns become a tricky question because of the intense management that tends to be associated with lawns. Um, it's not a net sink because it depends on how frequently you mow. Are you using a push mower or a ride-on ride mower thing? So it, lawns get tricky. Um, I have a question just about trees in the city. So in terms of your recommendation, it's not clear if the solution would be, well, we're not planting enough to solve the fact that they die faster, or should we just not plant at all and maybe just we should plant the trees in the forest? What, what is the, I mean, if you consider the cost of that, what would you suggest is the better solution? So I think we should be planting trees in the city, um, but I don't think that the most compelling reason and the reason that will stand up to a cost-benefit analysis is carbon sequestration. The reason to plant trees in the city is because of mitigating the urban heat island effect and reducing what the energy consumption in cities would be. If you want to keep canopy cover in cities, what I think, and I've thought about this for a little while, uh, what I think we really need to do is we need to keep planting, but more importantly, we need to keep those big trees alive. And the maintenance and what the maintenance budgets look like for parks departments, um, that's not what they prioritize because it's expensive. Um, but in terms of how much shade those provide and how much water they exchange to cool the city and the amount of carbon they store, those are unequivocally the most important part of the story and it's not where we're focusing. It's not as sexy as a tree planting initiative where you plant a thousand toothpick-like trees. Saving one really large tree may not seem like it's as much, but it has a much larger impact. Okay, uh, you answered part of my question. Um, I was curious, you said that Boston, I'm, I'm a native New Yorker, I live here, and I'm well aware of the initiatives they have in the city, but here in Boston, you're saying that with all of the construction going on, the innovation is doing all over, why would it be a negative, especially when you have the knowledge that you, the knowledge base you have here about 
positive effects. Is it political? Is it financial? You mean why are we losing yes, trees? Yes. Yeah. Cost. Um, <laughs> it's expensive. There's also a liability issue that's part of it. Um, there's a lot to it. Um, there's a liability issue um, with risk associated with having trees and limbs falling. Um, there's you know, the Grow Boston Greener Initiative. It started under Menino at right before the recession hit. Um, and you know, the analysis that we've done looked from 2006 till last summer. And maybe if we had looked at a different time interval, it would be a different story. But it hasn't kept pace. Have they been planting trees? Absolutely. Have the, has the rate of tree planting kept up with the amount of mortality? Not quite. Not, and they're not making great strides in the progress towards the 100,000 tree goal. Um, I'm trying to balance two things. Um, the, the trees are, are a CO2 sink, but they give back the CO2 when they die. Yes, but it may not be in the same place physically. Right. Because in the city, people rake up the leaves. When the trees die, the trees are taken down and taken out of the city just from an economic standpoint. So I'm trying to understand this notion that, um, you know, that it's a negative, that, that there's a, well, it's, it's not very significant in terms of a carbon sink because when they're dying, they're out of the city. So when, so it depends on if it's the city cutting, a, a city cutting it down or a private citizen cutting it down from their yard or, you know, there's lots of variables in here. But unless it's a large patch and large trees, it's not commercially viable to make two by fours out of it. Odds are it will be chipped or used for firewood, which means that within five years max, all of that carbon that had been sequestered for all those years, decades before, will be right back in the atmosphere. And now, one thing I failed to say, and I should have said this right at the beginning, is that CO2 is a well-mixed gas. It's a global problem. If you think about the exhaust coming out of the back of a bus, it is seconds before it's all mixed up. And so CO2 really should be dressed, addressed at a global level because it's everybody's problem. Um, it's not happening, but there is action at the city scale. I don't know if I quite answered your question, but... Because um, when a tree falls in the woods, whether you hear it or not, that's a different one, we won't go there. But it'll sit there. It'll, it'll take will, a long time. And it will decompose. And when leaves fall in the woods, they just sit there and decompose. But in an urban setting, all that is removed. Yes, but it still decomposes and usually decomposes more quickly. And in an urban setting, so we've, uh, we've thought a, a bit about this leaf raking problem. Because when you rake all those leaves and you put them in front of your house and they get pulled off uh, and they go to some sort of uh, composting facility, not a landfill, but some sort of composting facility, odds are they will decompose faster. But many of those homeowners will go to Home Depot and buy a bag of fertilizer to offset all of those nutrients that they had just put on their street corner to be hauled away. And those fertilizer rates will be at a much higher rate than the amount of nutrients that they had in those leaves, which is part of why you have higher nutrient content in those residential soils because of fertilizers. But if you, if you just deal with the carbon, is that still true? Because you're not really fertilizing the carbon. No, you're not. But if you put mulch, like wood chips, that's, that's a lot of that is carbon. Biochar. Yes. Um, uh, my question goes back to why trees are dying. Uh, do you think light pollution and non-native EMF uh, affects plant growth, um, biorhythms, and cellular lifespan? I don't know. Um, I've never actually thought about that problem. My, my off-the-cuff response is it's probably not a very large effect because the amount... I mean, you have light pollution everywhere, but those baseball fields and those street lights, those are, a f those are pretty concentrated sources compared to how diffuse, mo like if in the Boston example, that JP, Roslindale area, where, or um, West Roxbury, where you have some of the highest canopy cover densities, that light pollution won't be as high. I think it's much more of an effect in like your inner city where you, but I, I, I don't, 
I, I can't give you a great answer. Telephone wires, power lines. I, I. Oh, hi. Um, do you know about this initiative in the city of Paris that new construction has to have greenery or solar panels on this on the roof? Um, is this necessarily a good idea, given the cost of maintaining it and the structural problems of having trees on top of a building? Uh, so. Uh, so I teach uh, I teach a lot of graduate students, and every single year I have a stu every year without fail a student um, who does a project looking at the carbon implications of green roofs, and it's ineffective for carbon. It's it's not the right argument for carbon. The reason to have green roofs is not carbon sequestration. It's I mean the, the buildings can't support that sort of mass that it would take to have a significant effect. It's about what it does with the runoff and nutrient retention and reducing what the wastewater load is in terms of nutrients and treatment. Um, so from a carbon perspective, that's sort of it's not the it's not the point of those initiatives. Um, and in terms of what the infrastructure vulnerabilities are, I don't, you know, Paris is an interesting place where they're trying to do a lot to increase their efficiency, particularly following the 2003 heat wave that happened and all of the mortality and the vulnerabilities. Um, and there's actually some pretty big greening efforts in Paris because it's more um, efficient in their case. Um, I've seen a few studies of this, to plant trees to cool the city in the summer than it is to uh, have more air conditioning units. Uh, so there's a lot of initiatives underway. Um, I, don't, I haven't been following that in particular. Um, so I'm curious what you think about you know, the speed with which people make policy changes and implement policies because you have, on one hand, the uncertainty factor and then let's wait and see, and when we finally have all the data we need to implement this, we'll do it. But at that point, have you waited to a point where now you have a bigger problem? Or is there a happy meeting between short-term implementation of policies where it's uncertain and then potential things later? I'm sure there's a happy medium. We're never going to have all the information. The problem is constantly changing and evolving before us. Um, you know, there's, are there risks with being an early adopter? Absolutely. Um, AB 32, the California law, which, so the state of California has the most aggressive uh, regulations for greenhouse gases of any part of the country, and that law has had many challenges because it was aggressive relatively early. Are there people that could argue that it should have done more? Sure. Um, but many of the baseline numbers that were defined in that law were wrong, not because somebody was cheating or gaming the system, but because we had incomplete information. Um, and many of the problems in that, so it makes it very difficult to meet the statutory requirements if the baseline conditions are wrong. Um, and so, you know, I started out saying that our uncertainty estimates on urban scale greenhouse gas emissions are 50 to 100%. Yeah, that's 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 a problem. But we can also we can and are working on reducing those emissions. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can't write well-crafted policies. And there are things that we know work. Um, so we have to start somewhere. And cities, I think, move faster than most other scales of government. Hi. Um, so you're saying before that most of the externalities the signs show are more of a global scale. But if you look at pictures, a lot of times you'll see that, um, like in India or China, you see people walking around in these cities with gas masks. So I'd imagine that some of it, some of the externalities have to be localized to a certain degree. I'd imagine. Sure, sure. Yes. Got it. So I guess it wasn't that complicated of a question. But. No, they, they, they <laughs> certainly are. Um, you know, the heat wave that's happening in India right now, at 113, 115 degrees Fahrenheit right now. Um, that's happening in part because of how they've developed those cities and how much, you know, it, well, it's weather, it's some monsoon abnormalities and so forth, but it's also about how they've built and what their infrastructure looks like in the city. Um, you have massive urban heat islands in cities, so many of these effects are accentuated. 
Um, and you know the gas masks, the gas masks. A lot of that is about all the co-emitted species with CO2, and those are a problem. <laughs> um, and you know, I've most of my discussion and most of my work is on CO2, but it's easily transferable to carbon monoxide, particulate matter, SO2, NOx. All of these gases come from the same sources. And depending on the part of the world you're in, there's going to be more or less. Um, in place to capture some of those other secondary pollutants. Or so basically, a lot of the local pollution isn't necessarily the CO2, but it's a lot of the other yeah. stuff. The CO2 is more, is more global. It has to do with what the lifespan of a CO2 molecule is compared to some of these other species and how quickly it affects the body. And you know, you've got concentrated populations in cities. Just a quick comment and then a question. The comment is I'm um, in total agreement that the, the reason for tree planting in cities and so forth is um, multiple. And um, the co-benefits around uh, water and cooling and so forth are far more important than yeah. carbon. My, um, my uh, question is about the mortality and lifespan of urban trees. It seems that that's a huge target for improvement. Mm -hmm. and. Um, are there success stories out there, either with species or with management programs or what have you? Because if the growth improvement is so great, and yet that the, the mortality is so much greater, that, that seems to be an obvious target for urban uh, tree management. I think it's, it's a very active area. Um, many of the species that were planted in cities like Boston and Cambridge that are old cities, they were planted because they're pollution tolerant or were perceived to be pollution tolerant. So all those other species, the ozone, and they could survive that. So that was the justification. Um, it's tricky because you also need to think about um, volatile organic carbons that are released by trees. If you think back to Reagan, 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 um, you know, trees are the reason we have air pollution, which not quite, but is there, tr is there a piece of truth in what he said? Sure, because trees emit precursor compounds to ozone. Um, and so there's a, you need to think about what other gases are being emitted by the trees. So some of the native species, like red oak, for example, emit a lot of these volatile organic carbons that would increase ozone problems. Um, and they may not be very tolerant of the pounds and pounds and pounds of salt that we put on our roads as well as you know, just the suite of challenges. You know, growing in a very confined space, that, that box in the sidewalk, in, in that extreme example, is a tough place to grow. Although you can probably tap the sewer system to get all the nutrients you want. Um, so uh, I think there's active work, but it's not something that changes overnight, because you don't turn over that stock that quickly. OK, I think we'll take just two more questions. And then if you have extra questions, maybe you can see afterwards. Thank you. I very much enjoyed your talk. Um, you've alluded to this question. I'd like to hear you uh, have a statement on it. Management is, the, is one issue that, that's going to take up a lot of effort and, and resources. But are we barking up the wrong tree, so to speak? You mentioned that the, the trees that are adapted to city life aren't necessarily uh, high lifespan and require a lot of management and are, have their drawbacks. Are there other plants that aren't so beautiful and poetic as a tree, but might actually be better carbon fixing um, plants and not require nearly as much tinkering and, and, and sustainability, have better sustainability? Um, I, Moss, for example. So, towards what objective? Right, I mean, if you're object, so if it's a carbon sequestration objective, um, you know, we, we should have peat, peatlands. We should inundate the area with water and re slow, stop decomposition and, you know, make all of, you know, create these deep, deep carbon pools. Is that a viable strategy for cities? I don't think so, um, at least not large scale. Um, and if you're going to try to do those sorts of initiatives, cities probably wouldn't be the place to try that. Um, in terms of having something that has a tall canopy where you can get the shading, you can get the reductions in what the wind and the energy demand on buildings are, trees are quite efficient at that. Um, green roofs will exchange water um, and, and cool the city as well, as long as they don't get too dry. 
in which case they may become flammable or you're irrigating them. And if you're having to irrigate your green roof in a area that doesn't have enough water, then you know there's a lot of trade-offs in that. Um, grasses are something to think about, but again, it's it's towards what it's towards which end is it, if if it's a you know bio phytoremediation sort of problem of metals. Well, that's one problem. If it's carbon sequestration, if it's trying to reduce the heat island, I don't think there's an easy one-size-fits-all. Can we do some work to optimize which species we plant in the city? Yes. I'm pretty sure we're not there. So I don't, I don't have an easy answer on that one. So uh, my question was kind of following that in terms of, I read a paper recently talking about, I think it was around 20 or 25 percent of trees were acer species, of mm -hmm. street trees, and could we go non-deciduous with it and solve a lot of problems in terms of leaf falling and, and that sort of um, carbon release? And then additionally, kind of, Bouncing off what he said, um, Cornell has a lot of great research in terms of street tree uh, mortality and working with the soils to kind of figure out a good media to grow in, and that would be a cool resource that we so the soils are, are tricky. Uh, Cornell is doing, you know, there's, a, there's a, a handful of places that are doing really great work. Cornell is one of them. Um, but it's tricky because if you think about, and we did some work with the New York City Million Trees Project. Um, one of my postdocs followed um, uh, diggers. I think that's the technical term, right? Um, as they were pulling up pavement, he sampled the soils under the pavement. And um, those soils that, so what they did in New York, where in some of the areas where they were adding street trees, which is part of the initiative, they pulled up the pavement, they scooped out the soil, and then they put in some new soil, but you know the size of that table or maybe a little bit bigger, and the roots don't just stay in that small area. And the soil that they added was better quality soil, but the soil all around it, when we measured what the carbon and the nitrogen looked like, two-thirds of the carbon was gone and 95% of the nitrogen was gone. So it's a pretty tough place to grow. I, so this is really tricky work, and I don't know that the National Science Foundation would fund this, but I really think it's about sewers. <laughs> um, because those soils, in many cases, are horribly depleted, especially if they've been covered in entombed in pavement, but those trees are surviving. I mean, there's some um, fantastic um, uh, Alanthus, the tree of heaven that smells like urine. Um, <laughs> trees on, on BU's campus, I, I, I often will take students there, where the tree is growing. There is not an iota of soil exposed for as far as the eye can see, and this tree is flourishing. And it's BU housing that it's right next to. And um, I've had students that live in that housing, and they have massive plumbing problems. And I, th you know, I think a lot of it is old urban infrastructure and leaking pipes. But I also don't know if I actually want to sample that. <laughs> so on that poopy note. <laughs> Thank you. The other great thing about mass extinctions is that right after a mass extinction, you see a huge spike in origination. So you can think of this as sort of like rising from the ashes.